Tennessee This Week from WATE 6 on Your Side starts now. Coming up on Tennessee This Week, the race for state Senate in District 7. We're going to meet the Democrat challenging the Republican incumbent. And pain, tears, and anger as a Supreme Court nominee and the woman accusing him of sexual assault share their stories and face questions from senators. Plus, Randy Boyd goes from the governor's race to being picked as UT's interim president, a move that actually draws protests coming up on Tennessee This Week. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Tennessee This Week. I'm Kristen Farley. We are getting you ready for November, focusing on the state Senate race, this time in District 7, where the incumbent, Richard Briggs, faces a challenge from Democrat Jamie Ballinger. And today she is our guest right here in the studio. So, Jamie, thank you so much for coming in. Thank you for having me. I'm glad to be here. Let's just first start off with, for all of the people out there watching right now, mm -hmm. kind of tell them who you are and why you decided to run. Oh, thank you so much. Well, uh, again, Jamie Ballinger. I was born at the Old St. Mary's here in the district, um, grew up here. My dad grew up in North Knoxville, and my mom grew up in Powell. Um, educated here, went to the University of Tennessee for undergrad, University of Tennessee for law school. Um, my dad was an electrician, and my mom worked at Kmart, and they always said, you were going to go to college. And so I was the first in my family to get to do that, which was a huge honor. Um, and I'm just so proud of my folks and so proud of Knoxville. And my focus in running is to really make sure that we're focusing on uh, folks that get up every day and go to work, making sure that they can make ends meet, making sure that their kids have a great public education, making sure that when they're getting up and working, they can pay their bills, and making sure they have access to health care that doesn't break the bank. How's the campaign going so far? It is, um, it's pretty wonderful. Uh, it is a hard thing mm -hmm. to run for office. Um, but it's a great privilege, and the, the easy, fantastic part of it is I've met so many people across the district. I mean, we are constantly meeting voters, talking to voters, and most importantly, asking them what's important to them. And it's a really humbling experience. We've had folks um, share their lives with us. Mm -hmm. We've had some tears at the doorstep when they talk about particularly economic situations and, and some family situations. And so um, it's a pretty fortunate thing to get to do with your life. And I'm lucky that I've been able to do that. Um, I've been an attorney for about 10 years. Uh, I practice at Baker Donaldson and they've allowed me to kind of step into this role of public service. So um, I'm glad that I've had the opportunity to, to try to serve in this way. If you make it to Nashville, mm -hmm. how are you gonna make your voice known amongst a sea of Republicans? Yeah, I think that's a great question. And what I will say is I'm not going to Nashville um, to be hyper-partisan or to you know, say cute things and end up on TV. It's not who I am. I am going down there to use my experience as a lawyer. You know, in the law, we constantly don't agree with who's on the other side, but we evaluate both sides. And, and most lawyers, we work very well together and we work to a resolution. So I think everything in life comes down to trying to do the right thing, listening to both sides, and really building relationships. And I think the most important relationships you can build are with the folks that maybe you don't have the most in common with. Mm -hmm. I think those are the folks that in those conversations you probably learn the most because they're, they don't see the world the way you do. And so I think um, I'm going to deal with people on a, a person by person basis. And if they want to make Tennessee better, I'm right there with them and I'll help them and hopefully they'll help me. Let's talk about some of the issues here. Mm -hmm. What is your vision when it comes to health care for Tennessee? Um, I think the governor's Insure Tennessee plan, the Medicaid expansion mm -hmm. plan, um, I think it was a great plan. I think we need it in Tennessee. We know our sister states of Indiana and Kentucky have expanded Medicaid and are not seeing some of the, the fallout like we've had in Tennessee from not doing that. You know, there are 280,000 working Tennesseans, and these are folks getting up and working every day that would have health care. And 30,000 of those are veterans, and that's a huge um, consideration. Those folks should be well cared for. And we know that the fallout from, you know, we've already paid that money. Mm -hmm. It's not going to raise taxes a dime. Um, and it would help with these rural hospital closures that we're having. People say we may not have to pay for it right now, but in the future costs keep going up. So how do yeah. we pay for this? Right. So there is a matching component that comes online at some point. I believe we're entering into that um, the next couple years. And it's my understanding that the Tennessee hospitals have agreed to pick up the 10% matching because they too want Medicaid expanded in Tennessee. So I think we've got great, the stake, a lot of stakeholders are aligned. Um, on this plan, and I think now that the voters um, are aware of the virtues of it, the less of the, there's not as much 
fear of a downside. It appears that the Affordable Care Act is here to stay, that it's we have solid footing to move forward. And there's a lot of folks that agree with me on that issue, so I think we'll have good traction in Nashville. Would you ever be willing to cut people from the rolls if it meant you had to do that to keep the program moving forward? I think absolutely, and we've had to do that in Tennessee before. Mm -hmm. And obviously, that is a gut-wrenching situation. It's a personal situation. I think cutting folks is obviously the last thing you do. You really want to improve efficiencies. You want to make sure no one's on the program that shouldn't be on the program. But after exercising all those and exhausting all that, if, if folks have to be cut, you know, we have to do the responsible thing. I mean, when you're a steward of taxpayer dollars, you absolutely have to use those very efficiently and um, and not waste any money. You said you've been out shaking a lot of hands. Yeah. How high on the priority list would you say healthcare is to the constituents you've met? Uh, you know, it's interesting. It's huge, but more often than not, you hear about jobs. Mm. I, and, and that was interesting. I didn't anticipate that, right? Because I think healthcare has been in the news a lot. Mm -hmm. But we have knocked on so many doors. And, and I start, hey, I'm Jamie. I'm, I'm running to be your state senator. I really just want to know, you know, on a state level, what, what are you and your family concerned about? And a lot of it, it, it's jobs and economics. We have a lot of folks, uh, you know, there's a lot of discussion about uh, low unemployment in Tennessee, which we're thrilled. I mean, you know, that's a great metric. But when you dive into that metric, Tennessee also has more more minimum wage workers than any state in the country. How do we change that? Well, that's a tough nut. And, and there's, you know, I think what you really want to start with is, um, you know, because I asked myself that and I was talking to all these small business owners. And I said, well, how much do you pay your employees, right? right? And really, in my experience, it is not the small business owners that are paying the minimum wage. They are fantastic. They pay good wages. They bend over backwards to give their folks um, benefits if they can. It's, it's a great, I, and I work with a lot of small mm -hmm. businesses, and I also work with a lot of large businesses. But what seems to be the issue is a lot of the large businesses we induce to come to Tennessee and they get tax breaks, they will pay the lowest wage possible. And then often um, some of their employees will end up on public assistance. So we're paying for it one way or the other. So I think we've really got to do an analysis of are these tax breaks, are we actually benefiting from those? And are we investing in Tennesseans? Because that is a part of our you know, strategy for success is our people and our private sector partners. Let's shift gears for a little bit and talk about some news that broke over the past week. Randy Boyd being named yeah. interim president of UT. You said yeah. you were a UT uh, grad, yes. correct? So what yeah. do you think of this? Uh, UT is my favorite place in the world. I, uh, you know, coming from Anderson County High School and getting to go over there and the whole world was at your hands. I, I loved it so, so much. Um, I think Randy is um, a good community partner. You know, we would not have Pond Gap Community School without Randy's generosity. And so I know that his heart is in the right place. I know that he cares about that university. I know that he cares about Knoxville. I hope that he will listen to everyone as he's, you know, as he's charting a course for UT, but I think that he's certainly capable and will do a good job. The campus and the legislature at the state level have kind of had yes. some friction over the last couple yes. of years. How do you work to kind of make that relationship stronger? Yeah, it's it's a tenuous relationship, and I think that's a real real shame. I mean, when I look at the University of Tennessee, um, and I, like I said, I'm so biased, mm -hmm. but it's just the crown jewel of Tennessee. Um, it's uh, has a great access for people needing to go to college. It, our science and engineering and our partnership with ORNL. I mean, we are changing the world at Tennessee. Um, but I also, so I wish the relationship with the legislature was more positive. But I think we just have to keep the lines of communication open. And I think everybody has to respect every, each individual role. Uh, and I'm married to a school teacher, but I, I think a teacher in the classroom, that is their lane and they stay in that lane. Someone that has their, you know, PhD in administration, they stay in their lane and, and the legislatures be a part of that, but everyone having an appropriate amount of autonomy. Let's talk about real quickly, lower level school, elementary, middle, high school, mm -hmm. everyone wants safer schools. Yes. How do we accomplish that? Yes. Um, that's something I, you know, when you send a husband off every day to a public school, I, I can't say that I have not worried about that very, very much. Um, I will say that um, I, I am not 
one to make quick decisions about that. What I wish we had, and hopefully we are starting to have, is a risk assessment for every school in the district. Where are the vulnerabilities? We definitely need to make sure every school has one, at least one school resource officer that is circling the grounds and making sure that the grounds are secure. I do not think, unless there's data to prove it, that adding guns in the classroom will save lives. Uh, I understand. Safe to say that means you're against arming teachers. I am against arming teachers. I think we really could just see more uh, unintended guns going mm -hmm. off. I know my husband it had excellent classroom management, but things disappeared out of his desk all the time. And just the thought of waking up one day and hearing that yeah. a child had accidentally shot themselves or a teacher had accidentally shot a child, I know there's a better way to fix that problem than that. Jamie, we're going to leave that there. We appreciate yeah. you coming in. Thank you. Thank you so very much. All right, everyone. We also want to remind everyone in District 7 State Senate, she's facing off against Republican Richard Briggs in this race. We're going to hear from Dr. Briggs, hopefully here in the near future. The election will be here before you know it. Also, early voting starting October 17th, Election Day, of course, November 6th. Still to come, everyone, our panel of pundits weighing in. Stay with us. You're watching Tennessee This Week on WATE 6 on your side. All right, everyone, welcome back to Tennessee This Week. It is time now to hear from our panel of pundits. And joining us now here in the studio, we have attorney James Corcoran, journalist from the new online publication Compass. We have Scott Barker and also WATE 6 on your side political analyst George Corda. Gentlemen, good to see all of you. Good Thank you. All right, we want to start off with, we want to take a moment to say hello to Scott and find out a little bit about Compass <laughs> because some people may not be familiar with exactly what that is. Well, we just started. <laughs> we Literally. La <laughs> we, we launched September 4th. Uh, uh, but we are a uh, subscription-based online publication and uh, uh, newsletter. Uh, if you subscribe to us, and it's $10 a month, mm -hmm. um, and we give discounts if you go longer. Uh, <laughs> but uh, 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 what we do is every weekday we send you an email telling you what's going to be on the website. Then mm -hmm. you can go on the website and and uh, read our stories and uh, all politically based it's it is it is focused on Knoxville and Knox County uh, government and politics oh, okay and that is it we don't do surrounding areas a lot of stuff we don't we don't go surrounding areas and we don't uh, uh, delve into you know routine coverage of sports and entertainment and things like that it's, right. it's, well, it's a public it's a civic engagement Side. Well, we are glad to have you with us today. Thank Great you so here. much. Let's start with George as we break down some of the local politics here. District 7, State Senate, we just heard from, uh, we just heard from Jamie Ballinger. What did you think? Oh, she presents very well. There's a, a need for her to become a little bit better in terms of how she presents in a, I mean, drop the ums and the uhs because they're distracting. But other than that, I mean, she's fairly She's good in policy. I, w I looked it up when I heard her talk about Kentucky and Indiana mm -hmm. Medicaid. Uh, Kentucky's had to cut, no, I'm sorry, Indiana's cut 25,000 people off its expanded roles for not paying their premiums, and Kentucky may drop Medicaid expansion entirely because it's facing a $280, 90000000 million shortfall. And so it's not working quite as well as she might like. However, any... Any person running for office is better having someone running against them because it sharpens, even if it, they're a prohibitive favorite. Like, I think in this race, you've got to figure Briggs is a prohibitive favorite. Yeah, I was going to say, James, what do you think here? Does she have a chance against Dr. Briggs? Oh, absolutely, she has a chance. I mean, right now, we've got an unusual political climate, and the Democrats are trying to predictably wave, and I think that anything could happen. But uh, Briggs is certainly someone that, uh, you know, is unique in this political climate and that he's really been someone who's kind of reached the middle and I don't think he's really that different in terms of health care because uh, I think he's one of the few Republicans who's supported in Chair Tennessee. All right, Scott, what do you think? Well, I think that 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 Jamie is one of the uh, uh, a, a kind of a, a stable of really good Democratic candidates in in our area. There, there aren't uh, in years past there haven't been uh, many really strong uh, Democratic candidates that doesn't necessarily translate into winning, mm -hmm. but uh, uh, but they uh, uh, the party is offering some some good candidates for for various offices. Something we've been hearing a lot of this past mm -hmm. election cycle. Let's go ahead and talk about some of the the big news of the week. Everyone, the nation saw Judge Brett Kavanaugh and his accuser, Dr. Christine Blasey Ford, testify to a Senate Judiciary Committee 
Ford recounting a house party when she was 15 years old and Kavanaugh was 17. Take a listen. I believed he was going to rape me. I tried to yell for help. When I did, Brett put his hand over my mouth to stop me from yelling. This is what terrified me the most and has had the most lasting impact on my life. It was hard for me to breathe, and I thought that Brett was accidentally going to kill me. Now, Judge Kavanaugh calling the proceedings a circus, saying his family and name have been permanently destroyed by these accusations and choking up when he talked about his wife and his daughter. I have never done this to her or to anyone. That's not who I am. It is not who I was. I am innocent of this charge. I intend no ill will to Dr. Ford and her family. The other night, Ashley and my daughter Liza said their prayers. And little Liza, all of 10 years old, said to Ashley, we should pray for the woman. It's a lot of wisdom from a 10 year old. Now we want to stress everyone, we are taping them, this on done. Thursday, so we don't know the committee's decision just yet. In fact, we're taping this just hours after that testimony wrapped up. Um, James, I'm going to start with you. Nine hours of testimony. Do you think that was enough to change people's opinion? You know, unfortunately, I think judging by the reactions of the senators, I think this is probably going to be something that ends up people are voting down party lines probably to a greater extent than we've ever seen in this type of hearing. And you know, I've I've tried a number of these types of cases in a juvenile setting since this was a you know a young child or a 17 year old accused of having a, abused a 15 year old, but 30 years removed and trying to prove whether or not something happened with that much time in between is an extraordinarily difficult task. Yeah, I think everyone at the end of the testimony said there was really no clear evidence on either side to support either of their arguments and, and we're probably not going to see any clear evidence here. Both uh, both individuals testified very credibly. Mm -hmm. Both people are saying that. A lot of people are saying that tonight. Scott, let's talk about um, was there anything in today's testimony that surprised you? Uh, the one thing that that surprised me was uh, the emotion. Uh, 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 both from Dr. Ford and, and Judge Kavanaugh, uh, it was uh, uh, they were they were both very emotional, and, and you know we saw uh, you know Judge Kavanaugh you know kind of breaking up and mm -hmm. and all, and, and uh, uh, you don't see that very often in congressional testimony. So, do you see that as a sign of weakness? Though a lot of pundits were saying that's not what we want from a Supreme Court nominee. I saw it. I. I saw it as just uh, uh, a humanizing element. I didn't. I didn't really see it as a sign of weakness, uh, because uh, anytime somebody is going through something like that, whether you know, regardless of whether you think he, he did it or not, is uh, uh, and the same with, with Dr. Mm -hmm. Ford. Yeah, uh, you know, s seeing that how it affects them personally is uh, gives you some insight into their personalities. George, uh, the analysis as the day went on before testimony was even wrapped up ha has been pretty harsh on both sides. A lot of people playing just down party lines, but um, criticizing both who testified today or on Thursday. Th what this has thought? nothing to do with fairness, justice or finding the truth. This has everything to do with politics and power. And anybody who says different is selling something. Because if the situation were reversed and it was a Democrat in the seat and a Republican woman making the charge, the comments from the senators would be opposite and the coverage of much from the national media would be vastly different. There are three Democrats. Meaning, were you surprised that it stayed on all day long? No, no. I'm, shoot, this is. As far as the American media is concerned, there's nothing else going on in the world. And so they're going to stay on this because people have been caught up in it to a degree. But the, the reality is, to this point, I talked to a prosecutor the other day and I asked him, how would you investigate this? He says, you can't do it. It's not possible. For all of the reasons, it's been 35 years, there's no evidence. And I, I substituted for Hal Hill today. And Jamie Satterfield was one of, the, one of my guests. She covers courts mm -hmm. for the new Sentinel. 
And she didn't opine on whether she thought one or the other was telling the truth, but I asked her about the FBI. FBI keeps coming up, FBI keeps coming up. And she said, everybody talks like the FBI's got some magic wand to make things happen. They don't. In fact, when the FBI investigated Anita Hill's allegations against Clarence Thomas, they took three days. And they came back and there wasn't anything conclusive. The, and it doesn't matter. If you put the FBI on it and they looked at it for a week and they didn't come up with what some people want, they'd say you should have looked at it for two weeks and you should have left, interviewed more people and you should have done. The Republicans are in a political bind. They have to vote on this and they have to get and him through. And of course, we do want to remind our viewers once again, we are taping on Thursday because there could be a lot of developments before this actually makes air. We're going to have to leave the topic there, though, for now, everyone. Still to come, trustees choosing Randy Boyd as UT's interim president. We're going to talk about that when we come back. Stay with us. You're watching Tennessee This Week on WATE 6 on your side. All right, everyone, welcome back to Tennessee This Week. The conversation continuing right now with James Corcoran, Scott Barker, and George Corda. Gentlemen, again, thank you so much. Another big news happening this past week, UT trustees voting unanimously for Randy Boyd as the interim president of UT, taking over as Dr. Joe DiPietro retires. Boyd, of course, was just a few weeks ago running unsuccessfully, as it turned out, for the Republican gubernatorial nomination. While the vote was unanimous, protesters were on hand speaking out against the choice. So first up, everyone, George, let's start with you. What do you think of Boyd leading UT? Well, Randy Boyd will... He's a good guy for running UT. He knows how to run big operations and make them work well. And last week, you might remember, I said there were three Groups. main constituencies. There were the people who want, you, want UT to progress regardless, the liberal establishment within UT who will want to make his life miserable, and then you've got another group, which is the internal people who don't like seeing an outsider come in. And so I think what's going to happen here, some of the people that were protesting uh, you take that up a notch or two, they're, they're going to be yelling about everything he does if they see a hint, a whiff of anything conservative in his approach, they're going to be screaming bloody murder. And the, the advantage he has is he's not, he said, I'm only going to stay here two years. So he can, he can do things without worrying about whether Long he'll term. be there 10 years from now. James, were you surprised at, at some of the protests that happened on campus? Well, I think certainly after the, the very hotly contested and very very right wing campaign that was ran, I don't think it's surprising that uh, you know universities naturally going to have a certain amount of very liberal students who uh, are protest minded. So I don't think it's very surprising that a certain amount of people came out. But at, at the end of the day, I think if you really look at Randy Boyd's history, I don't think he's a, a very extreme uh, character that might have been come across a little bit differently during his campaign. Scott, do you think we'll see anything huge out of Randy Boyd over these next two years? I think that that, that Randy may try to to do some bold things. Uh, as George said, you know he's not going to be there for very long, so uh, he doesn't have to worry about uh, sticking around for a long time. He can go ahead and go in and, and make changes. That said, Randy is uh, uh, comes across as being a a fairly uh, conservative guy, and I, I don't mean that in political sense as much as as in a in, a, in an approach to how he manages his business. I don't think he's just going to walk in in the first day start making wholesale changes. But uh, but also wouldn't be surprised if if after uh, six months or so he he has some uh, some strong ideas about uh, uh, what to do. One of the things to watch for is the outsourcing. Yeah. issue and and I think that he said he wasn't going down that road but some people keep pushing that issue going yeah. are you sure yeah uh, uh, he, he says he's not going down that road uh, but he also will be taking a look at, at how uh, UT operates and will uh, he's going to look at it with a, with a businessman's perspective of uh, how can I make this organization operate more efficiently all right, real quickly, uh, we want to talk a little bit about, we have a, a debate coming up, a senatorial debate coming up mm -hmm. as well as a gubernatorial debate, and we saw Marsha Blackburn and Phil Bredesen debating earlier this week in the race for U.S. Senate. Uh, Blackburn said Bredesen's campaign was bought and paid for by Chuck Schumer. Bredesen criticized Blackburn's vote against the Affordable Health Care Act. So what do you guys expect to see in these last few weeks before early voting starts? We only have about a minute here. Real quickly, just 10 seconds. It's going to get heated. Well, Absolutely, it's going to be a really hot and close race. So I think Blackburn is going to be really trying to tie 
Bredesen and to national uh, Democrats. Scott? I think, I think he's right, but also I think that's a bad approach for Blackburn because Tennesseans are familiar with Bredesen. They know he's not bought and paid for by, you know, from, with Chuck Schumer. So I think that's, that's, that's going to be a tough sell for her to make. George, Tennesseans don't know who Chuck Schumer is. <laughs> they're, mi they're missing the target. They need to take all of Bredesen's comments in the past, supportive of Obama, and slap him up there with Obama and put him out there in front of Tennesseans. If they don't do that, Bredesen very likely win. All right, everyone, that is our time. Thank you for being with us. And again, everyone, we're going to have Bredesen and Blackburn debating again October 10th right here on WATE. Have a great weekend. The views of guests and panelists of this program are their own and not necessarily those of WATE 6 on your side or Next Star Broadcasting Incorporated.